Hi, this is Lauren Baker, founder of Search Engine Journal. Uh, thank you for joining our SEJ Marketing Think Tank today. With us, we have a special um, group of guests and sponsor in Page One Power. We're going to be going over real link building in 2016, scaling human effort. So, as you can see, uh, Cody and Amy are there right now. Way of Cody and Amy. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a little bit. Uh, but first, I want to go over some basic housekeeping to really make um, this webinar process more enjoyable and educational for everyone involved. So um, first of all, um, you'll see the GoToWebinar control panel um, probably to the right of your screen. And uh, during the webinar itself, we ask that when you have a question, please go ahead and um, type it into the question box that you see there on the webinar control panel. Um, questions or comments or anything else, you can go ahead and give it a test right now if you want to. Um, and send us something. But basically, um, myself and other moderators will be going over your questions and asking them to Cody and Amy during the presentation um, and at the end during our Q&A slash conversation session. So if there's any specific questions you have about um, link building, um, maybe something that you've always wanted to know or something that your boss sent you an email asking you this morning, go ahead and write that down will help you get those answered. Um, secondly, our uh, official hashtag uh, for the webinar is hashtag SEJ Think Tank. So I highly recommend that if you're on Twitter right now, you go ahead and tweet something about um, watching the Page One Power Link Building um, webinar on SEJ Think Tank. Get the hashtag in there. And if you have any additional questions or call outs, feel free to tweet about this while it's going on. That would be fantastic. Uh, during the presentation itself, we're going to be issuing um, two polls. Um, so get ready for them. They're going to pop up on your screen. Uh, you just, just basically answer multiple choice. Uh, don't just answer C for everything. That, that, that's a myth. That, that always works. And um, we'll be uh, sharing the results of that uh, during the webinar, along with after the webinar. We'll also be videotaping this and sending it out as well. Um, when uh, the webinar and QA session is over, and when, when we're all done for the hour or before the end of the hour, we're going to close out the webinar and you'll be served a survey. If you could really take the time to fill out that survey, that would be fantastic. Uh, we learn a lot from that and really make sure that since we're all SEOs at the end of the day, we tend to optimize everything, so we like to optimize the SGA marketing think tank experience. Um, that's it for right now, so I'm going to go ahead and hand things off to you all, Cody and Amy, to first introduce yourselves and get things started. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. It's really an honor to be here. We're excited to, to share some stories about link building with the audience and uh, kind of share our philosophies. And uh, So yeah, let me introduce myself real quick. Uh, I'm Cody Cahill. I'm the project manager at, at Page One Power here. I've uh, been with Page One Power for about four years, uh, helping clients to increase the organic search traffic with campaigns centered around link building. Um, so, so yeah, like I said, really excited to be here, and uh, I'd like to introduce Amy Merrill. Hi, Amy. Hi, Cody. Also thrilled to be here. Uh, I've been with Page One Power for a couple of years as well. I've done a lot both on the team-facing management side, but also on the um, project management side, so I'm a little bit of, of a hybrid, I suppose. Um, and I guess the other really important thing to know about me is that I'm just absolutely obsessed with tacos. Yes, that's, uh, that's a crucial element yet to know Amy, to know, is to know that. So before we get started, I think Lauren wants to jump in here with, uh, with the first poll of the day. Yes, and um, before I get that going, it looks like we're having a little bit of technical difficulties on our end, and I'm not able to launch that poll. So one second. There we go. It launched. So good thing we have some little helpers behind the scenes to make this happen. First question, <laughs> what best describes the scale of your SEO efforts? Are you an in-house individual, independent contractor, in-house SEO or marketing team, or independent SEO marketing agency? So please take the time to fill out the answers in the poll. That will really help Cody and Amy craft the presentation for today and also really help us really learn a lot, a lot about you. So please take the time to fill that out.
Great. And as those answers come in, um, we'll go ahead and close it in about five seconds or so. So go ahead and uh, vote. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, last chance to uh, fill it in. And we got the results in, and we'll be sharing them momentarily. Here we go. So it looks like 30% uh, of you are in-house SEOs, marketing team, 30% in-house SEO marketing agency, 28% um, in-house individual, and 11% independent contractor. So again, thanks for that. It's really helpful um, to know that most of you are in-house and or uh, working at a, an agency or an independent or or you're an independent SEO with a bulk or in-house marketers. So that's fantastic. And I'll let the both of you get started or continue. All right. All right. Thanks again, Lauren, and thanks everyone for filling out that poll. It's always great to know who our audience is, and it sounds like we've got a, a good mix of in-house people and kind of lone wolves and agency people. So I hopefully we have something actionable for for all of you. Uh, we certainly uh, we have some slides pre uh, prepared. And we want to we want to run through, but we're also really looking forward to the Q and A section. So if you have a specific actionable question you would we'd like us to tackle, uh, please get those questions in. And uh, so yeah, without further ado, let's jump into this. Uh, you know, link building in 2016 is 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 a crucial element to any uh, organic search campaign. Um, it, it has been part of the Google's core algorithm since the onset, and that and that remains the same. And what has changed with link building, Amy, in, in the last few years? You know, Cody, there's been so many really huge changes. I think we all still remember the day Matt Cutts kind of condemned guest posting, and then you know the fallout that. That came after that while we all struggled to interpret that. Um, but the, the, some of the biggest changes in link building is really that everyone's kind of coming around finally to understanding that if you want your site to be around a couple years from now or you know even a decade from now, you're going to have to do link building a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, the quick easy wins, the, the hacks you learn on those black hat forums, they're, they're not going to help you in the long run. Um, and that's been great news for us because ultimately it's just an acknowledgement that what we've been doing this entire time, it really works. Yeah, one of the big evolutions of link building in the, in the four years that I've been doing it is in 2012, link building was kind of a, an SEO tactic that was just something that was all about rankings and, and wasn't really done with uh, with the end user in mind. And and as it's evolved, it's become more of a real marketing thing. It's a core to a, to a, to a, uh, any sort of marketing strategy. And so we're going to get into a little bit of, of the specifics of that. Uh, uh, one one other thing about li links in in 2016 is is link building has kind of been replaced as a, as a term by by content marketing and everyone's doing content and promoting great content and that and that's a you know that that's a wonderful thing it's a big improvement over the the way SEOs operated a few years ago but what what if we have we found that content alone isn't enough right right there's a gap there and especially right now everyone's just crazy about shareable content obviously the rise of platforms like BuzzFeed have really done a lot for that, but that gap that I just mentioned, it really comes into play when we look at how that, that shareable content really performs. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what studies are showing? Yeah, I had the honor of being on a, a webinar earlier this or uh, in 2015 with Steve Rayson from BuzzSumo, and uh, they partnered with Moz to do a, a really interesting study that, that they were trying to find a correlation between uh, content that gets really promoted well on social channels versus content that earns links. And uh, both Rand Fishkin and Steve were surprised by the results. And the results was that there was hardly any correlation between the type of content that gets social shares and gets spread around socially and, and ones that, that get links and perform really well in organic search. And the lesson there is that it turns turns out just producing great content and, and, and getting it out there isn't enough. You need active link building. You need, you need to do that with intent, which means finding the right, you know, researching and doing the whole, doing the whole thing that, that goes into acquiring high quality links. And beyond that, you know, it's, it's a different type of content that's really shareable. It tends to be something that's kind of buzzworthy right now, and people are talking about it right now, 
but next week or even maybe tomorrow, it's it's going to be a tired topic. We all kind of remember that blue gold dress scenario, right? <laughs> That's the kind of content I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, the type of content that is going to perform, excuse me, perform well long term is obviously that evergreen type of content that isn't just applicable in the moment, it's applicable in the long term. So when we talk about doing link building right, it, it comes down to a whole lot of different factors um, that, that we'll jump into a little bit more here in depth, but it really starts with relationships. Absolutely, and, and one final note on, on doing link building right, it, you know, there is no shortcut anymore. There's no get, get links quickly, bump your rankings up artificially. If you're engaging in those types of tactics, you're probably, you're probably not going to be in it for the long term. Sometimes they can work short term, but our philosophy at Page One Power is that for the links that are going to make a difference now and in the future are links that are adding value to the web. They're adding value to the site that's linking it. They're adding value that, to the site that it's linking to. And maybe most importantly, the link is adding value to the user of the web. And if you're building links or engaging in, in link acquisition methods that doesn't, that, where all three of those factors aren't there, you're really setting yourself up for ultimate failure, whether whether that's just through a through a penalty or, or getting nabbed by penguin, or more likely those links are just not going to maintain value over time. One thing I'd like to add real quick too, Cody, if you wouldn't mind, is that it's really nice too when you can put together a piece of content that's almost like a hybrid. So it it gives ongoing evergreen value and it's the kind of content that picks up links and larger publications are going to want to to cover and utilize and then, then link to you. But at the same time, it's the type of content that when that larger publication shares it on their story, right, which links back to your client on their Facebook account or their Twitter account, it also goes viral, quote unquote, goes viral within those platforms because it, it's almost like it's, it's gratification across the board and then chances are that other publications Right, are going to see that happen, and they're going to be like, "Oh, we want to, we want to publish something about that same topic matter that's going to be shared a lot too," and they pick up that infographic or story or ebook or whatever it is that publication A picked up, and then lots of publication B start picking it up and doing the same thing. So it's really great to see when you put together really good content that's going to last for a long time, and then people just pick it up naturally and start socially sharing it as well. Yeah, that's the ideal scenario, isn't it? Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, it, it's difficult to 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 nail that. There's no necessarily blueprint for that type of content that's going to go viral, uh, you know, or necessarily the type of content that's going to earn a lot of links. However, there, there are ways that you can go about within your research and your investigation to to see what type of content will perform well from a linking standpoint in your niche, and we'll get into that a little bit. Absolutely. But as we mentioned earlier. Basically, uh, one of the main themes of this presentation and, and, and something we take very seriously here at Page One Power is the notion of, of building relationships. And when we say that, we, we, we're talking about relationships uh, uh, with potential linking partners and influencers in a given niche. We're also talking about relationships uh, between the client and various, various marketing channels that might also be working alongside of our, our link building campaigns. And finally, the, the relationships amongst the team that you have building links and, and, and how important that can be as well. Let's start with uh, relationships with the people that we want to link to us though. Being at Page One Power as long as I have, it feels like I keep just saying the same things over and over again, but in case you haven't heard this yet, outreach is critical to link building success and it's far and, and wide the thing that I see messed up the most. Um, I still, even today, myself, receive emails that are clearly templated with a plugged-in name, um, or in some cases, your name, which I just, I love that. Um, and it, it just causes me to pause and scratch my head. It seems like our industry is evolving, but some parts of it are a little stuck. Mm -hmm. Outreach, number one, is that place where I'm seeing us still a little stuck. And I know you've probably read and heard a lot about effective outreach and building relationships, but what exactly does that look like, right? 
Cody, do you want to share some of the critical elements of just a really outstanding piece of outreach? Well, I mean, absolutely. An outstanding piece of outreach is going to be, you know, outreach that you've done your homework, you know who's on the other end, and you put some thought into it. I mean, you mentioned people doing outreach wrong now, and it's usually because they're trying to do shortcuts. They're trying to they're trying to blast out 500 emails and crossing their fingers and hoping that you know that one or two people link. And that's that's a, we found that to be a really ineffective way to go about it. And, and you're much better off, uh, you know, uh, doing your doing your research and and crafting a message that's you know individualized to that person and really always adding value with the outreaches, which is we'll get to it again. And when we talk about relationships, I mean, we're talking about you know potentially relationships with with publishing sites. We're talking about relationships with with niche influencers. It could be people in your in your local market, and it could be you know if you're trying to get like uh, links from a certain types of resource pages and and Amy can you speak a little bit to the difference between like your outreach and relationship approach between uh, depending on the type of site you're trying to earn a link from absolutely it comes down to knowing your audience and knowing what that person on the other end looks like I think we typically tend to forget that on the other end of that web form or that dot gov email there's still a very real human being that's reading it and answering it um, and they all have varying interests and time, right? So in that case, if I'm not reaching to a business, um, especially one of those more less fun brands, I don't know, <laughs> they're very staunch, similar to like a government site or maybe a library. I'm going to be to the point, I'm going to tell them everything they need, and I'm going to be very professional. However, if I'm talking to maybe a niche influencer or a journalist that I'm building a relationship with, I really want to give them a slice of me in that package as well. I'm going to cover the basics and obviously give them this, the information that they need, the pertinent information, but I also want to build a relationship that's going to last. Um, and part of that crucial element is that they know who I am too so that I'm just not the other end of an email either. There's more to that though. Uh, this relationship building, it re really requires a finesse. Um, it's something that even some of the best outreachers on our production floor who have been doing it for years are constantly tweaking and changing. You're failing ultimately if you're sending the same email or the same, same type of template over and over again because like our entire industry, the way you approach outreach and the way you approach other people needs to also change. Yeah, and the right the, the right way to do outreach is going to vary slightly depending on you know on on who you are and, and what, what client you're working on or what your business is and and who the target is and what specific link building tactic that you're that you're going after. So you need to be testing these things and trying new things, but but. Uh, I mean, there's one truism that we've found in an individualized manual approach uh, you know to outreach you can have loose templates that you that you modify and test but you're never really going to be just blasting out the same thing to to a hundred different sites it's it just doesn't work very well all that being said though there is one truth essentially that you can apply to any email you send it's it's the single most important element I would argue and the one that, frankly, is not included the most. Um, we like to call it our value add. It's, it's the reason you're even asking for the link. If you kind of scratch your head and go, ooh, I'm not, like, what is the reason? I just want my site to have better rankings, right? Is that the reason? No. <laughs> the reason needs to be directly correlated to the person you're outreaching to. Either you have one of those pieces of content that Lauren mentioned earlier, that really great shareable stuff that they're just going to inherently want, and that's a value add in, a, in and of itself. Um, or maybe you're promoting a brand that will pass equity onto the site you're asking for the link from, so it's a win-win situation. But if you're ever in a position where you're going, I, I literally have no value here to add, well, it, it's time to go back to some of the basics then because you're missing a big big point of why we even do this whole link building thing. And, and we've also found that that your outreach approach is much more successful when you in, include that value add and you're confident about it. If, if we're going around where we're, we're essentially asking people favor asking people for favors, hey, would you please link to me? I was wondering if you might, you know, do me a favor. That 
that doesn't come across strong. It doesn't say, hey, I've got something of unique value to your users of your website, and I think that this link would add value to them. If you're not able to do that, and you're not able to convince the site owner of that, if you don't believe that yourself, you might need to rethink your content strategy and, 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 and how you're going about link building. One well, old uh, PR Sorry, go ahead, Lauren. Oh, I was going to just add one old PR trick that helps there, too, is uh, exclusives and embargoes. So, like, before you're putting together that great piece of content and not letting anyone, like, contacting someone's like, hey, SEJ, uh, we have this upcoming ebook on, on, on link building in 2016. Before we share it with anyone else or put it on our site, why don't we let you guys put it out there? Mm -hmm. it, it's something that your audience would really like. You know, this is, these are some of the most socially shared posts that you have on your blog, and you know, so you can even pull that material and be just be like, hey, look, SEJ, you guys get twice as many shares on Facebook or twice as much traffic per, you know, this study for your link building type posts. How about if we add to that? And then the publisher feels really nice too because they're getting that special piece of content from you before any other competition does. So something like that also can help from a, a relationship perspective too because then once you get them one time then sometimes they're hooked so to speak. It's a, that's a great point Lauren and, and, and also kind of speaks to that if you're if you're producing content with the intent of, of having it earn links you really want to be doing your research in uh, of who might be the sharers of said content in advance and you have a plan already in place you're not just producing a piece of content that you hope will do well publishing it and then being like alright let, let me figure out who wants to share this you already know who those who those people are and the people you're going to target with your outreach in advance of that publication and sometimes like you know you reach out to them even before that hey I'm, I'm gonna be producing this yep. thing um, would you would, would you like me to send you a link to it when it when it goes live and like you like you said Lauren appealing to their ego is is a really great way to, to go about that and, and and in some ways the the value add of that outreach and then if they can't you can always ask for a quote because mm -hmm. getting that quote in the piece too from the editor or a writer at a publication is going to lead to them sharing it and more than likely linking to it as well. Yeah, it really is a great tactic. But I, I will note that, that that some of that kind of ego bait things have have somewhat been overdone, mostly in the SEO realm, where it's like, oh, I've, I've rounded up 33 experts, and here they all are. Um, you know, that 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 can get a that can get a little oversaturated. But truthfully, that kind of thing still does work really well in niche niche markets where it hasn't become you know so I don't know overdone. Yeah. So let's transition here a little bit and talk about the, you know, uh, from our perspective, the relationships that we have with our clients. And and in some ways, if you're an in-house or, or or working uh, working directly for a company, um, this could be like the relationship that you have with with other other departments, kind of thing. But the the, the most crucial thing is that there's open, clear communication between the link building team, whether that's an outside agency or in-house, and you know, and upper management and, and, and the clients that are setting those expectations or, or dealing with those expectations. Can you speak to that a little bit more, Amy? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've we've found in our experiences that you know the three points that you're seeing displayed on your slide here are essential, but I think that might be even more true for those in-house um, teams or even an in-house individual. It's frustrating for us when we have limited communication internally. I can't even imagine what that would be like for you. However, I do know from experience that when we have our PR teams, our content teams, our um, technical SEO team, if you have one, or generally probably an individual, all talking about the same things, your content will be better, your website will be better. Um, it's, it's essentially an in-house win-win-win. Um, Our best clients and the ones that we have the most successful long-term campaigns with are, are, are people that are truly partners. Uh, occasionally we'll have, we'll have people come to us and, 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 and they don't want to be our partner. They just, they, they've heard they need links and they just want a list of links. And it, it's really hard to effectively build the kind of links that are going to have lasting value if you're, if you're in a silo and you're not integrated with, with, with the larger company's marketing efforts. And so let's talk a little bit about specifically how to integrate, you know, between different types of marketing efforts. 
One of the huge ones is PR publicity teams, and uh, this is actually a, a topic that Amy is going to be speaking on, I think, in April in London at the Brighton. Brighton. So, so this is uh, uh, something that, that we're both very passionate about. But Amy, can you tell us a little bit about our experience uh, dealing with, especially with large, uh, larger companies that have very active uh, PR and publicity teams? Can you speak to some of the pain points that we've seen w w when those types of clients come to us? Absolutely. Let's first clear up just the biggest myth that drives me crazy, and that's the fact that, as you've probably heard, if you create great content, you don't need to build links because you'll just naturally earn them. Um, and I think my issue with that is for the vast majority of, of people, um, brands, businesses, that's just simply not true. And it, it could be because that content they're creating just doesn't quite hit the mark, or it could be because that their um, PR team doesn't even exist, so it, it can be a struggle for those people, but I think the biggest thing that we've seen, and the, the reason that this bothers us so much, is because some of the very, very best links that a company can get are from these types of PR campaigns. Um, but they're the links that are left on the table. They just sit there waiting, begging to be linked to. Um, and, and when we're involved, we can naturally come behind and pick those up as they fall. But the opportunity that's being missed here is that if a link building individual or team or whatever you have at your disposal and a PR team actually communicated before content went out, that content could be further optimized to allow for even better links. Um, it's kind of that, would you prefer quantity over quality, or would you rather have both? And when you marry those two, you get both, but it's just so rarely done. A, a very consistent theme with, with our clients um, is, especially the larger brands, is they've got an SEO manager that comes to us uh, you know, for help with link building and to, and to improve the organic search, and, and, and they're not necessarily connected very well with their PR teams, and it's really consistent across the board where the SEO people will say, hey, our PR people are doing great stuff, but they're just not considering organic search. They're not considering links, and, and so we've developed strategies in, it, in order to integrate with their PR teams, you know, one, to maybe educate them about the value of links, but as they're doing their things, we can complement them by making sure that, that as their message is spread you know, across the web through, through various publications and such, that, that we make sure that we're uh, leveraging that, that great publicity to earn links and improve organic search and not, and not just the... Uh, the, uh, the, the more traditional aims of, of PR and publicity teams. Let's talk about another area, though, that we, we get a little bit of strain as well, and that's from the content development teams or internal teams developing um, copy for the web. Uh, and one of the really missed opportunities here when content teams aren't working with link building teams is ultimately the final product. Um, when we talk about types of content, there's obviously your, your converting content and then your kind of middle funnel content that's going to be more relevant to someone that's actually a little bit more interested, knows about you, and is kind of feeling you out. Where we really exist, though, is at the very top with that content that is going to be great for a wider amount of people, but it's, it's kind of surface area. And this is the type of content that if a content development team is working with us, we can create together and earn more better links. But when content's being created without any consideration to the link building process, it, it just it typically misses the mark and lands somewhere else in that funnel. And you, you mentioned you, you mentioned uh, the top of the funnel content and that and that content that that appeals to a wide variety that isn't promotional, that's informational and adds value to, to users is the type of content that's going to earn you the links. And your product pages, which we know is, are the pages that you want to rank ultimately, those product pages probably aren't going to be the best linkable asset you have, and it's going to be very difficult to just build links to to that 
specific page. However, our experience shows that if you are developing that top of the funnel content, whether that's blog posts or, or larger media in-depth pieces, and those are topically relevant to, you know, to your products that you want to rank, that we can build links to the, that top of the funnel content and then through your internal linking structure that is passing keyword signals and, and, and page rank to your important pages. And so the notion that, that if you want your converting pages to rank, you need to build links just to that is not only a, it, it, it's, it's a myth and it's, it will harpoon your link building campaign if, that, if you're taking that hyper focus because the, the amount of sites in which you're going to be able to get links that are really of unique value to end users is going to be very small. Now, all that being said, let's take a quick step back and acknowledge the fact that, hey, I get it. I understand some of the reasons why you might be hesitant to allow your link building and your content bodies to intermingle. Um, often we hear this very reason. It, it comes down to the brand and that protective quality of, of taking care of your brand and making sure it's being talked about in the right way. Um, but the good news is we get that. Uh, we find it is extremely important to match your brand, your tone, your values. Of course, always casting, uh, you know, a positive light. But it's it's more than that. When we partner together, we really mean that in that that partnership sense. We inherently become your brand, especially out on the web. Um, and ultimately, if that kind of marriage doesn't happen between the two, that's going to ultimately cause another kind of hiccup in your right. campaign. If you don't have that relationship, if you don't have that communication between whoever's doing your outreach on your behalf and and, and who your brand is, you know, you're, you're going to have people blasting out emails that you wouldn't be proud to put your name on. And why would you want to do that? And so that's why that communication, that relationship is so important. Um, so, you know, and, and crafting that perfect outreach and knowing Knowing who you're representing and who and who's on the other end at all times is huge. Now let's take a quick break and toss it back to Lauren. It looks like we've got poll number two. You there? And yeah. mute is off now. So we've launched the second poll. Um, would you like to learn more about link building services from Page One Power? They select one of the following. Yes, not at this time, or maybe, but I have a few questions. So again, thanks for everyone for filling out the first poll. If you could just take a second or two, fill this out. We'll give you some time. And um, this has been a great um, webinar and presentation. Thanks, guys. It really, I've been jotting down a lot of this over the course. And we have a lot of questions that have come in, too. So we're going to have oh, a pretty active Q&A right. session. Yeah, and, and some people really took me up on the, hey, <laughs> ask anything, especially something that your boss may have emailed you this morning. So we have some good ones. Um, so please, uh, if you haven't um, clicked yet, uh, please select one of the following. Uh, would you like to learn more about link building services from Page One Power? Yes, not at this time. Maybe, but I have a few questions, and we'll be following up. So I'll do my little countdown here. Five, four, three, two... Last chance. One. Okay, we can close the poll. And um, yeah, uh, thanks so much. So um, for those of you that are uh, that would like to learn more, Cody and Amy will be following up. Thank you. All right, let's keep rolling. Um, what we're going to go into now is kind of the relationships amongst the team, um, which, which might be less applicable if you're kind of a, like a lone wolf or an uh, you know an uh, or work an in-house person without the team. But but uh, in some ways, I think that there's always going to be that level of team collaboration, and it's 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 really important. And it, it, here at Page One Power, we have we have we, we set our teams up in groups of people, so there's constant collaboration. And, and can you speak to how, how important that has been for our success? So that the teams that Cody just mentioned in the small groupings, that didn't always used to be a way of life here at Page One Power. When I was first hired a few years ago, um, we actually worked as, as individuals um, in a little bit more of a siloed manner. And having actually been a link builder at that point and progressed with the company to where we're at now, where we, we intentionally put people in groups where they can get the most out of 
um, brainstorming and, and collaborating, I've been able to really see the, the change that that has brought on, onto our link building. Um, not only are we building more better links than we ever have, but it's just, it's awe-inspiring to see what comes out of the collaborative meetings our groups have. Um, for example, every morning we allocate a little bit of time for what we call our pod meetings. Essentially, about four people get together in a room, they talk about things that are difficult for them, the problems they're having, uh, maybe article ideas, or brainstorming different types of pages that would be appropriate for our client. Um, this has, has literally allowed us to do more better than we have ever have done before. If you're sitting out there going, well, great, I work alone in an office, it's okay. But I, I would strongly recommend you find and build your own team. Um, and that can be on a group like Inbound, or you can um, find people on Reddit. Frankly, it's, it, there's multiple channels, but, but if you're feeling siloed, I would change that and get off your island immediately. And, and so uh, we're kind of, we, we get asked a lot, what kind of tools do we use for this kind of collaboration? And this is true between the collaborations between the teams, but also sometimes between, between the, you know, the, the clients and ourselves and, and, and various marketing, marketing channels that might exist in our clients' business. And, and uh, you know, everybody in our industry seems to have adopted Slack as the go-to kind of chat chat uh, tool and, and, and we're on board with that. We use Google Docs all day, every day. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 uh, and we use BuzzStream and BuzzStream has, has uh, we've, been, we've been using BuzzStream for about two years now and it really was a game changer for us. Uh, BuzzStream is a tool specifically designed for you to manage and organize your outreach and uh, I really recommend it uh, to, to uh, whether you're an agency there, you know, or uh, specifically uh, just just as an individual link builder, it it, it can be very uh, beneficial as well. Any other tools you can think of that for, for use for collaboration uh, for that kind of communication, Amy? I thought I had one, but I it's lo I've lost it. Um, <laughs> we use Basecamp I, a lot. We have used Basecamp. That look that works a lot more effectively when we're managing those relationships more with like a content team or a mm -hmm. PR team, it's a great way to develop content together collaboratively um, and make sure that you're all on the same page. Um, but realistically, what it boils down to is regardless of what tool you have at your disposal, it's being organized and being able to talk to people through multiple channels. So as we're getting to the end of the presentation and getting ready to uh, to take some of your Q and A, uh, we got the the uh, the kind of the age old question that we get a lot here is, uh, hey, can, I want to I really want to scale my link building. How do I do that? And uh, we found that there's really great ways to scale link building, but they might not quite be what you, what what the uh, somebody intends when they say they want to scale link building. Oftentimes they're talking about, hey, how can I how can I take this tactic and automate it so I can so I can do ten, ten times more and doesn't really work that way. Not not the kind of links that we think are the ones that are going to have the lasting value, right? Yeah, what it comes down to is if in your mind you're envisioning our link builders working in front of a bank of computers automating email lists, you got us all wrong. What what we really have are 60, 70 plus people on this wide production floor and each person is how we're scaling. Each one of our link builders makes us better and bigger, right? Each individual isn't asked to do 10 times more, and, and that's the type of scaling Cody's saying doesn't work effectively. What we're talking about is honing your actual team and equipping them to be able to really collaborate together and work with our multiple tools to be able to create a well-rounded campaign for you. As your link building campaign grows, if you're if you're starting a link building campaign from scratch now, you need to know that that you know it's going to grow and build, and your expertise is going to you know uh, your expertise is going to expand as the campaign expands. And this is really important with one thing that we didn't necessarily address. That's that's a core link building tactic that, that, that has been for a while, but, but the way you go about it has changed. And that's with the, with the, with the guest post that you've mentioned, or as we, 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 we kind of shy away from using that term because it's had the negative connotation. But uh, we've found that when you produce off-site content, uh, we, we become a regular contributor at certain sites, and within that 
content, there's a, uh, there's a helpful link to another piece of content on our client site that is informational and beneficial, and it's a link that, 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 that makes sense contextually, and the users would want to click on it for, for more information because, the, because where it's linking is content that adds value. It's, it, those are some of the best links, the most effect, effective links out there, and you can scale that in the sense that um, you build more relationships and the more kind of authority that you build up writing about a certain topic and a certain niche opens up new doors and so I, I really encourage anyone that's that's thinking about a link building campaign make off-site public uh, you know publishing core to that strategy it's one of the most effective ones out there and then finally we just wanted to make sure we didn't forget about you guys uh, that aren't in the same type of circumstance we are what, do you, what are, I think, your pointers or your personal takeaways for someone that is a little bit more isolated in our industry? Well, you want to be building relationships online in, in order to effectively with, with influencers anyway, and so you're gonna you're gonna do do some of that collaboration and that kind of group group teamwork. You know, there's things like I mean, we we do a lot of uh, a lot. Live, live Twitter chats and that type of thing, and different depending on what your niche, you, you you find out where that where your audience exists online, where your where your peers exist online, and become part of the become part of the conversation, add value to that that conversation. Not only will that help inform your content and, and your and your strategies, but it'll it, having those relationships will will enable your your you know link building outreach to be that much more effective anyway. You, you don't want to do link building in a silo. We can't say it enough. And so you need to find some way to, to be a part, you know, to be collaborating and be part of the overall marketing plan, whether that's a small, whether you're a small business or a, or a giant company. So yeah, so link building in 2016, you know, it's about making real connections. About it's about adding value to the web. It's about doing your research and your homework in advance and, and knowing who your audience is. And and it's it's scalable in the sense that that if you do it right, you get better at it, and 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 you'll be able to acquire more more better links. But you won't. But you're not. You're focused on on lasting value and not fleeting numbers. And thus concludes our uh, the, the presentation part. Uh, we're uh, excited about this part because now we get to uh, have Lauren throw some uh, some questions at us and put us on the spot. Don't worry, they're mostly softballs. So, oh, all uh, right. Thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, really <laughs> appreciate that, and and, and uh, you really got the gears turning um, in terms of not just link building but also client relationship building, right? Um, because that's essential to success at the end of the day. And that gets me started with one of the first questions. So um, really, you know, in order to kind of connect the dots between PR and social and get that um, communication going really between the SEO team and the public relations team, what are some of the first steps that you take in order to make that happen if it's not something that is currently set up within your client's infrastructure? Great question. I would say the very first two steps are communication and organization. Uh, before you can get started, you have to get everything on the table. What is each group working on? What are their upcoming projects? And how is that documented? When I talk about organization, you need to get it all down on metaphorical paper. Whatever tool you're using, whether that's a base camp platform or a project management platform, um, being able to list out your product or excuse me, your projects and especially planning for the future will allow you to start to, to slowly integrate. Now, you're not, not going to just be able to jump in and immediately have you know, a marriage between all of your departments. But what you can do is start out on a small scale. You got a piece of content coming up and I don't know, let's let's plan out a little further. Three months, let's start talking about that specific piece. Make that your mm -hmm. test run. Figure out what you're doing right and wrong in that small integration. Get your best practices down and then start to scale that process. 
uh, uh, get your editorial and you, you, you have editorial and social calendars where you're planning that out. Get that in the hands of, of your SEO and your link building teams. If, uh, if your uh, publicity people have a list of contacts that they're going to, make sure that, make sure that the, your link building team knows that. I think one of the first steps is, is, to, is to further convince traditional PR people that, that what we do as SEOs and link building is a legitimate, is a legitimate thing. It's not a shady practice of not the shady practice of yore, and uh, and we're making progress towards that, but that hasn't happened in, in, in most companies yet, where there's a marriage between those two. But that, but that's that that's the future, and 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 uh, link building has evolved to be something much more like PR, and so that's coming. And so getting everyone on the same page is 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 essential. And if if you do that now, you're going to be well ahead of the of the competition. Yeah, I, I agree with really planting the seeds with one campaign. So, you know, if that's not set up internally to get things started, um, sometimes, like what I've done in the past, is I, I've pitched a campaign that goes above and beyond link building, where, you know, let's introduce this specific thing to PR. It's something yeah. that they can, it's physical, it's in front of them, it's a plan, it's something that they can chew, it's something that they can look at and see how they can integrate things moving forward. And then, you know, once you get those different divisions involved with that one piece and it sets them up for success and they see that, hey, you know, this really worked, so the result has typically been, what can we do next? Or, right. hey, exactly. you know, sometimes the PR teams, they have their calendar and they have some, you know, dead time or whatever, and they'll, they'll email and they'll be like, hey, what can I help with next type thing? And it's so sometimes really getting that one campaign going has been good. Um, mm -hmm. Another tip I would say too is that, like from from an organiza organizational and project management perspective, like you brought up Slack and Basecamp. Um, one thing I like to do is integrate um, me or my staff members into the traditional project management tool utilized on the client side, so we're in there as users. So we can, if we see that there's a conversation going on between like the VP of marketing and PR and SEO is not involved, um, sometimes I'll just kind of pipe up and say, oh, well, we'd love to help type thing and with the approval of my direct point of contact first. <laughs> um, and um, they kind of see that, you know, sometimes PR swamped and they want to get more things done. And if, if they know that search has an agency that they signed on, to be able to help, maybe we can help overflow on that side as well. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Um, so here you go. Um, in terms of someone that's starting a new site from scratch, how to get started with link building when, when launching a brand new site? Um, you know, directories aren't talked about as much as they used to. Yahoo directory is more or less gone. Um, so if someone's building a new site from scratch, really where do they start with acquiring those foundational links, so to speak? Well, I, I, would, I would start by thinking about the, the content that's going on that site. I wouldn't necessarily, if you're starting a site brand new, um, I wouldn't necessarily be worried too much about acquiring the links right away. I would be thinking about I would be thinking about strategies that are going to enable me to, to acquire those links down the road. And so I'm going to be, you know, uh, you know creating content that is of unique value and placing on my site. Um, I'm going to be doing that kind of uh, research to find out the types of people, you know, uh, core demographic research or creating the marketing persona so I know who I'm targeting both, you know, with my products but, but also who I'm targeting with my content on the web. Um, and so you have a sense of where you want to operate. And then I get to producing that content and making sure that it's up on that site first. Uh, there are a handful of quote unquote directories out there that I think you know offer some modest value. Generally speaking, directories are kind of very low value and, and not not necessarily a link building tactic that I recommend. It's not the worst thing in the world to, to go out and find if you, if if uh, if you're a local business, there's you generally a handful of, of local directories that aren't. It isn't the worst idea to grab a few of those to get some signals going, but don't think that you're going to move you know move rankings very much with that. Link building and getting your site to rank is is a long term play, and so you want to be thinking long term. You want to have like a year strategy um, of producing content and, and doing the outreach 
Um, don't worry about ru rushing out and, and grabbing links right away with your new site. Think about the long term. Great. And I'm glad you brought up local businesses as well because there's things like chambers of commerce or other local businesses they can kind of forge relationships with and also local press sometimes um, it's a little bit easier to kind of build that kind of yes. test your relationship building with local bloggers or local press and then expand from there. Um, this is a very interesting question. Um, I'm actually This came up twice um, and I'll just get into it. Uh, so from an agency perspective, um, it seems like it's, it's difficult for this person to be able to do the relationship building because based upon their contrast with their clients, they're not allowed to expose themselves to the influencers out there and bloggers out there as working for their client from a link building perspective. I'm not sure if this is under an NDA or no press type clause or if they're just like not allowed to say, hey, I'm from this agency and I'm building really, I'm asking for a link or have some great content for you to share. Um, also, turnaround time. Um, turnaround time makes it difficult to spend a large amount of time building the relationship before getting to ask. How do you recommend handling these situations? Um, so, the, first of all, they're not allowed to say who they work for and it sounds like their contracts are so short that they don't have time to build relationships. So, how would you recommend handling that situation? I feel like this is a bit of a two-parter. Um, first, what do you do if you don't want to go, hey, I'm Amy from Page One Power, here's what I'm up to. Don't do it. Um, we actually, so, let me tell you a little bit about how we go about getting links via our content especially. Um, Every writer that we work with is themselves. They're writing for themselves. They're outreaching as themselves. So, for example, when you're outreaching, instead of saying, hey, I have this great content from client, you're going to introduce yourself and explain why that content's valuable. That's your, that, remember, that's your, your value add and your outreach. And if that content is truly just valuable based on what it actually presents to the website that you're reaching out to or because of the brand equity it has, whatever that reason might be, it frankly doesn't matter who you are or where it came from. It, it, it stands alone. Does that make sense? If, if what I'm hearing here is if, if you're working for an agency and you're not allowed to disclose what you're doing or your, or your client doesn't want anyone to know that they're link building or that they have a partner with you. We have those, we have those instances at Page One Power. We used to have them a lot more. That, 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 that kind of harkens back to the day when, when link building and SEO was kind of an under the table kind of thing and you wouldn't want, you, you, you'd want to invest in it, but you wouldn't want people to know you were investing in it. And so in some ways I think, I think your, your approach is off from the, from the get go if, if that's kind of what you're thinking and your approach is definitely off from the get go if you don't have time to relationship build. If, if, if all it is is, hey, I've got to fulfill this, this order for links right now. Um, I don't necessarily have real good advice for how for how to how to manage a campaign like that because those types of quick win let's let's just grab some links really quick and not worry about the long term and not worry about building relationships and not worry about you know it, are our links adding value to the web if you're going about it that way um, I, I think you're off base I think you're doing I think you're doing 2011 link building and not 2016 link building. Well, and one yeah. other thing to note too is if if you feel like you don't have the, the time to build those relationships, I'd maybe take a step back and evaluate the types of relationships you're building and the, the purpose of them, right? We want to work smarter, not harder, and that's one of the best reasons to have relationships. Um, re a relationship in and of itself implies that it's lasting. It's, and what I'm hearing is that it's kind of a one and done for you, um, and I get that that happens based on what niche your clients are in, et cetera. However, what, what are the chances you're going to later have a client in that same niche and then need to return to some of those same types of sites that you were already working with? Mm -hmm. If you had a relationship in the first place, you wouldn't have to do more work here. You'd just jump back and rekindle that 
romance that you had prior. Um, so I would say reevaluate how you're using your time because it doesn't sound like you're doing it in the most effective right. way. Right. If, if I'm working for an agency and clients are coming and going, I'm going to be building relationships with website owners across the web, with publishers across the web that could potentially be applicable to many clients. Mm -hmm. Not every relationship is going to be applicable to all clients, of course not, because it varies by niche, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not going to be think. I don't want to be start. If I'm working for an agency with multiple campaigns going, I don't want to be starting from ground zero with every one. I want to be able to leverage the, the experience that I've had over four years here, you know, building relationships to help all the clients and, and not be starting fresh, you know, with, with, with nothing happening with each, each time a, a new client comes on. Yeah, you know, I agree across the board. Um, number one, it sounds like the, it was a contract from 2011 that was sent into the future that was signed off on, really. Mm -hmm. So, like, um, what I would say is, you know, if, if you're not being paid for the strategy or the relationship building or the time put into this or you're doing month by month, really rethink that because you know if you're brought on to build a link building campaign for a client, before you jump into that first month for X number of links per month, make sure they know that you have to take the time to really set this up, right? To yeah. work on the relationships because, I mean, it's just like, it's like Mad Men and advertising before AdWords came about. The reason that people went to advertising agencies is because advertising agencies pulled in a lot of different clients to then be able to negotiate airtime, whether it was on TV or the radio or in magazines or on the web. That's what agencies do. That's also what marketing agencies do. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like, yeah, basically what you guys said across the board. Um, but take the time to build relationships and also, you know, think about what you're signing. Um, if you are getting started and if you, you are a consultancy or if you, you need to narrow, sometimes it's easy to sign off on something you end up losing, though, in the long run. So try to take all that into account with either with, with this client or, or maybe some of your, some of your future clients. Um, okay, some more basic questions that are not necessarily on the business development side of things. So, is there a such thing as too few? Uh, you you want to think about you want to think about your the links within a certain piece of content. You want to think about it not in terms of. Uh, you know, how much link juice is going to be passed, or, or can I sculpt this so there's only one link? You want to think about the, the, the number of links that are appropriate for a given piece of content is however many links would add value to the user. Um, if you look at di different, uh, different uh, you know, publishing uh, publishers on the web, you'll see that certain types of sites, you know, in, you know link more, others link less. Um, but I think any any good piece that I read on the web is going to have several links to, to to authoritative, helpful sites. And so, if we're creating a piece of off-site content that's going to include uh, one of our client links in there, we're going to make sure that we that we have other other authoritative links within the, in that piece of content. One, because that's better for the end user, but two, that sends strong link neighborhood signals as well. Um, and this is also important for your on-site content. You want to have a good combination of helpful internal links to other pieces of content on your site and external links. Occasionally we'll run into people that have the notion that, that, that they should never externally link that, or, or that they need to somehow sculpt their page rank uh, you know, by, by only linking to crucial things or they no follow some links or they play silly gimmicks like that that m maybe gives you some momentary bump but probably not and moreover hurts you in the long run because you're not thinking about the reader first. Agree, agree. So we only have a couple of minutes left and if you submitted questions uh, that you haven't been able to get answered live, what we're going to do is we're going to send all the questions that we received over to Cody and Amy to be able to answer. Then we're going to be sending them out in the SEJ uh, Marketing Think Tank webinar recap, which will also have a video and bullet points along with a slide share uh, link to this presentation for everyone to check out. So um, first of all, before we click over to our survey, um, thanks again, Cody and Amy, for taking the time today 
to uh, run through all of this. It was really fantastic and very conversational, which I'm sure I enjoyed and a lot of the, uh, the group enjoyed as well. So thanks again. Our pleasure. Thank you. Great. And thanks to Page One Power for setting this up. Um, this, has been a, this has been fantastic. And like I said, we're going to be following up um, with everything across the board uh, for everyone that attended today. Our next Search Engine Journal webinar is, uh, or SEJ Think Tank webinar, is going to be on February 3rd. It's going to be yours truly. I'm going to be talking about going native, uh, specifically how native <laughs> advertising has grown um, SEJ's revenue. We started uh, toying with native advertising about a year and a half ago, and it's become um, basically the base of our of our revenue and income coming into the site. So. Uh, if you're interested in uh, earning as a publisher, uh, and I'm sure there's some publishers that have attended uh, to learn more about link building, please uh, sign up to also attend um, Going Native um, on February 3rd, uh, SEJ Think Tank. So uh, thanks again, uh, Cody, Amy, and the whole Page One Power team for putting this together. It's been great, and I'll give you a chance to say bye. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, and like, like uh, Lauren said, we'll be uh, happy to, to touch base with you on your qu questions that didn't, be, that didn't get answered. And uh, again, thanks for having us. It was a great time, and talk to you soon. Yeah, just have a great rest of your day, and thank you for your time. Okay, bye-bye.